Hello everyone, my name is Alex and in today's video we're going to be continuing the Karo Khan vs Everything series. If you haven't seen the previous episodes, playlist will be linked below, but basically this series we play rapid games on chess.com, trying to climb to 2000 ELO, and regardless of whether we have the white or the black pieces, we play a Karo Khan-esque setup just to explore the opening because I think it's really really good at basically all levels. It can be played with white and black, obviously it's more of an opening from the black side, but using it with white can still help you explore some of the ideas of the opening. Uh, I have been messing around with my mic settings, so apologies if it's a bit weird, but hopefully it should be better than it has been in the past few videos. With that being said, let's get into the game. Okay, so my opponent does go e4, which allows us to basically pre-move Akaro Khan. There is nothing that white can do on the second move that will absolutely destroy our position if we play d5. My opponent goes for an exchange with the knight on c3, which is a bit inaccurate because this pawn wants to go on d4, right? But what is going to happen is that this knight is going to be misplaced on the c3 square, as we're now seeing, because the d4 pawn cannot be supported by a pawn on the e-file because he just traded off his pawn on the e-file. So it really needs to be supported by a c-pawn, either on c3 to protect it or on c4 to attack the center alongside it. But... The problem with the pawn being on c2 is that the knight is on c3 and blocking it from doing anything to support the d4 pawn. I'm going to go knight f6 in the meantime. And also the fact that we have a semi-open c file means that we can probably put a rook or maybe a queen there to apply pressure to the knight and the pawn, which are both not that easy to defend because of the way that the knight and the pawn are kind of situated on top of each other it's just a bit of an awkward setup it's difficult to explain but that, that, that's my best attempt bishop to g5 is interesting because i don't really want to allow double ling of the pawns if he takes if i take with the e pawn then the d pawn is isolated and if i take back with the g pawn it's difficult for me to castle I could not castle and try and use the G file for attacking purposes, but it feels a little bit dubious to do that. Um, knight e4 is the move I would normally play, but then my opponent does get to exchange his knight off, which I just told you was an incredibly awkward piece. Knight d7 obviously would defend the knight, but I don't really want to do that. e6 means my queen can defend the knight, but does block in my bishop. Oh, that's not the end of the world. In um, the Karo, typically the idea is that you go c6, d5 so that you can get the bishop out before going e6, right? Because if you play like a French defense and you start with e6 and then go d5, then your light squared bishop is just locked away immediately. So in the Karo, normally you get the light squared bishop outside of the pawn chain first, and then you play e6 to lock it outside the pawn chain. What I'm doing here is just keeping it inside of the pawn chain voluntarily. And my opponent exchanges his bishop off without me making him do it, which seems like an odd decision, because this means my development is going to be incredibly easy. The only question that we really have to ask in this position, I'm going to go a6, by the way, because I don't want anything coming to b5, because I want to go bishop to d6, and I don't want knight to b5 to be annoying. Queen e2 is a very strange move. I guess he's threatening knight to d5 with a pin on the pawn, but... I mean, <laughs> you're just blocking your own development. That's kind of just like, I don't know, an elementary threat. I think bishop to e7 is the most logical move. Uh, we could go bishop to b4, I suppose. And then if he castles, we can ruin his structure. Bishop e7, the idea would be to block the file off so that this pawn isn't pinned. But I think bishop b4 is probably a little bit better. We also have pressure on d4 because the queen no longer defends that square. And this knight obviously does. But when we go knight to c6, which we most likely will, then d4 could be in a bit of trouble, which would be fantastic. This queen on e2 is just so awkward. I'm not really sure why my opponent's done that, unless he was just really banking on the fact that I wouldn't see this tactic. Seems a little bit odd, but that's the only reason I can think of. Because if you're going to go queen e2, you should be castling queenside because you can't get your bishop out. But if you castle queenside, then the doubling of the pawns on c3 is going to be a bit of an issue. Like I said, 
at the very start of the game, this knight on c3 is awkward, and we're ex we're exposing that awkwardness. Queen e3 is played, defending the knight, allowing the bishop to get out, but, you know, there was no need to do this. <laughs> there was absolutely no need. The knight is still pinned. So I think I'm just going to go knight c6, just apply pressure to d4, and we'll see what my opponent wants to do. I'll probably castle, maybe go bishop d7, rook c8, Again, apply more pressure to the C file. Maybe we can start expanding on the queen side. Okay, my opponent castles, which means that the, the uh, D4 pawn is very well defended. But we'll see how long that lasts. We'll see. There are ideas in these types of positions to have put the bishop on D6 rather than B4 to try and play bishop to F4, pinning the queen to the king. But of course, it's too late for that now. Mm, well, now my opponent is threatening this. So I need to castle, because the knight's no longer pinned, right? So we'll castle first, just to get rid of any silly threats. And at the end of the day, I mean, opposite side castling, it's going to be an interesting position. I think we're slightly better. Um, yeah, I could go back to d6 to threaten this. I could go back to a5. But then knight a4 into like c5 is kind of annoying, I think. I'm going to go back to d6. We're going to threaten this tactic. Um, I'm honestly hoping my opponent doesn't fall for it because that would be pretty sad. Um, I'd like to get a bit more of a game out of this. So I'm hoping for something like king to b1. And then um, this wouldn't make sense. Okay, yeah, he goes g3, which achieves the same goal. I don't know if that's the best way of going about it because you're weakening the knight and therefore the f2 pawn behind it similar to what i was saying with um this setup here but um you know whatever he wants to do fine by me i think bishop d7 makes a lot of sense if knight e5 we have more than enough defenders on that square because the knight on e5 would obviously attack the bishop but we don't have to worry about that i'm just going to develop Probably put a rook on c8, maybe a rook on b8, and then throw this pawn forward. Opponent's put in pressure, he has no threats, um, so I'm not really concerned. Maybe I'll start with b5. The problem with my opponent going pawn to a3 is yes, it kicked the bishop away, but now it's just going to act as a hook for me to basically move a pawn where if this pawn was back on a2, if I went b5, my opponent could just move his knight. Now, if I go b5, sorry, b4, it's a double attack. Because my opponent has put his pawn on a square, that it can be attacked at the same time as the knight. Which means that either he moves his knight and I take his pawn, or he takes my pawn. He has no way to avoid the pawn trade in that position because he's created a hook. I think um, hooks are sometimes a bit of a difficult concept to understand because... I feel like it's not all that easy to put it into words, uh, to like really explain it without just showing you, and wow, B. That is not a good move. I can tell you that straight away. <laughs> that is not a good move. And I'm very much um, considering just sacrificing the B5 pawn to go A5. And I think that's probably the best course of action. Because I do not care about the B5 pawn. Look at the weakness of these of these um, dark squares right now. And there is a scenario potentially where the D pawn comes loose and this diagonal becomes weak. My queen could always drop back to E7 and get involved in the attack. I can bring a rook to the C file, to the B file. Yeah, my opponent takes here. He does attack my bishop to be fair. But I think I can just drop my bishop back to E7. And he has no way of preventing um, the files from opening up. There is maybe a case to be made for sacking the bishop. But I feel like that's a little bit too ambitious. Just a little bit. Let me think about this. Is e5 an idea? I don't think so. Uh, I think bishop e7 is fine. Bishop e7, knight c7. Rook c8. Knight back to b5. Takes, takes, takes. Equal material. 
and um, we have a crushing attack. Or even maybe rook a7 if he goes knight c7. And then after knight b5, rook b7. So that this rook can swing to the a file and this rook's on the b file. That's an idea. But basically by going to a7 first and then to b7, we're doing it while attacking the knight if it does go to c7. So that would be the idea of that. Again, it depends on what my opponent does. Yes, having to drop my bishop back means that I lose a tempo, but I don't really think it matters. I really don't, because how is my opponent going to do anything right now? He has no attack. Yes, his bishop is targeting h7. That is meaningless. He can't bring his knight to g5 anyway, because we cover that square. I can go h6 if I want to make sure h7 isn't under threat. So there is no danger whatsoever. And my opponent, not only with a3, but with b4, has voluntarily just opened up his kingside. These dark squared diagonals. Okay, yeah. He wants to take the bishop. That makes sense to me. If we take... We open up the attack on the knight, but it is defended. If takes and pawn takes, attacking my queen... That's kind of annoying. Hmm. Let's, let me think. That's a good move. That's a good move. I could go bishop to e8, but that seems so passive. That seems a bit too passive, but maybe it's... Well, then he has, like, knight to c7 with a bit of a more annoying fork, so I'm not sure. So that, that's a very good move. It is. If we take with the knight and then queen takes, we can immediately win our pawn back and probably have a better endgame. If knight takes, pawn takes, that's my issue. I think I probably have to go, like, queen g5. If queen takes, bishop takes f I don't love it. Bishop back to e7. If takes, we take on a3 first with check, and then we win the a5 pawn back. And again, I think we have a slightly better end game because he will have two pawn islands, and we will have one, and he will have an exposed king, but we have no queen to exploit it properly. That's a very nice move. I don't think I have a choice. So well played to my opponent. I did not consider the move knight to e5. Yeah, okay. And I think we just have to go queen g5. If he goes f4 before trading queens, then it's a bit annoying. We probably have to go queen to h5 or queen h6. Hmm... Our queen's a bit locked out of the game, for sure, which is not great, but we still do have a lot of pressure, and our queen could find herself a way back into the game at some point. I think h5 makes more sense, which I know we're making ourselves vulnerable to g4 in the future with tempo, but it just leaves our options open, I think, a little bit more, because we have this diagonal to potentially infiltrate on in the future. Say this queen moves away, and this bishop, I don't know, moves away, then we can maybe try and access the third rank through f3. Very nice defensive resources found by my opponent, and he currently is up a pawn. But the pawn that he is up is a b-pawn. I don't really want my b-pawn, because whilst it's nice to be up a pawn, I have an open b-file. And if I put a rook on b8, and I have a rook on a8, and all these pawns disappear, which probably is going to happen, then my opponent could have a very scary um, position to have to deal with. On top of the fact that he doesn't actually have an attack, I think my opponent's played this well, right? Finding this knight to e5 idea. But I think he probably should have traded first. Probably should have traded first. He maybe could have even tried knight to d6 to block my bishop's connection to b4. 
that might have been a shout. But now, with the Queen still on the board, I think that I'm the only person that can benefit. I don't really understand that move, to be honest, because I think I just take, no? This potentially exists in the future, but it's not really that big of a deal. I'm assuming my opponent wants to try and play f5. I assume that's what this knight is doing in conjunction with the bishop. But there's more pressing matters on the queen side. I don't think that was the best use of my opponent's time. I'm not sure what was, in all honesty. I don't know what he could have done better. But this seems odd, because he's been moving this knight a fair bit in the last few moves. He's obviously taken. He's then jumped back here. Okay, no, I I think I, I was looking at the notations and I saw knight e5 and I just saw a knight move and I assumed it was that one. So that was a bit silly. But, um, okay, my bad point aside, this knight... It's a good piece, but it was also a good piece on b5, having access to these dark squares. If anything, it's not so good a piece here, because I control the light squares pretty well. Okay, yeah, g4. So I was always expecting to be hit with this at some point. Uh, I don't think I want to take it. I don't think I do. If I drop back to h6 now, then it's a bit better, because f4 is actually weak. If g5 is played... Then I can always go back to um, h5. g4, if I don't take it, also will support an f5 push, which I think is what he's going for. So queen to h6 makes a lot of sense to me because we're pinning the pawn to his queen. Even if his queen moves, the pawn will be pinned to his king. And if he goes... Excuse me. If he goes pawn to g5, then we can just put our queen on h4 or h5 or something like that. H4, I didn't really want to put my queen on immediately because of moves like knight to f3 and then maybe transferring into g5. But for now, I think this is good. And if he does go g5, then he's going to lose support for his f5 push. H4 makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't really want to get my queen trapped. That wouldn't be good. Now I'm not sure what I should do on the queen side because I now have not a chance to actually attack. I could play bishop to c5, an interesting idea to apply pressure to the knight. But then he could just take here and waste my time. So maybe rook a3 pinning the bishop to the queen. And then I always have this check in my back pocket. I think I like that idea. And as long as my rook is protected, which it is by two pieces, then bishop h7 check can't win a rook. Which is a tactic that you need to be aware of here, because, of course, if this bishop can move with a check, then the queen will be attacking the rook. But it is very well defended by two pieces, so we don't have to worry about that for now. Just worth being aware of, of course, because if you always... If, if you do a lot of puzzles and like watch a lot of YouTubers explain tactics... Or like tactical motifs in the positions that they're playing or looking at then you're just gonna brainstorm more of these potential tactics that 90 percent 95 percent maybe won't even come to fruition or maybe a t would be too irrational and require too many bonus steps to even exist in a position like here where to make this tactic work, I would need to move my bishop and somehow lose this pawn. So in the vast majority of cases, these tactics won't actually exist. But in that 5% that these tactics do exist, you'll be very happy that you were able to see them. Wow. Okay, so he's running for his life. That's hilarious. Okay. Uh, rook c, sorry, rook c8 is tempting to get on the c file, but I suppose c2 is very well defended. Bishop c5 is now more tempting because he can't play a takes b4 to deflect my bishop. And then we'll have a whole lot of pins going on in this position against this queen. Even if the queen moves, 
we have um, attacks on the king. And if our bishop does end up taking here, then bishop h7 won't work releasing the rook, which was another tactic I spotted earlier, because the king is now in the way. So bishop c5 looks like a good move. And I'm just trying to freeze his pieces, essentially. I'm trying to use his queen against him to freeze lots of his pieces in place. Uh, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a move like rook to a1, trying to trade off my powerful rook. But also you have to bear in mind, my opponent still can't really play f5 because I will take the knight and the queen won't be able to take back because the queen will be pinned to the king. So although the queen is, still def is now defended, it still can't allow a tr trade of queens just because of tactical reasons. I was considering moves like b3 to maybe force bishop to b4, but I don't think that actually achieves anything. That's just a check for the sake of a check. And the opponent's king has too many safe squares to go to anyway. So I think bishop to c5 makes a lot of sense. Because I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to win this position. I feel like I'm definitely better. Because I'm now up a pawn rather than down a pawn. And my opponent's king is on d2. I have the bishop pair. I have a very active rook. My queen is in a bit of a weird spot. And my opponent's pawns look scary. But there's no obvious breakthrough, because the only real pawn break is f5, and as we've established, that does not work. So, I don't know how I'm going to win this position, but what I do know is that I can just continue to improve the placement of my pieces. My next move might be something like rook c3. Just to be annoying, I don't know. Maybe I need to try and improve this bishop. Maybe f6 is a good move to try and force a breakout and unleash this rook. Maybe try and play e5, open up this bishop if I can. Try and challenge my opponent's central pawns. f6 looks pretty tempting, and if um, I can successfully play it, it might release my queen, my bishop, and my rook. So that would be a way that I could try to optimize my position further. Because I think these two pieces are optimally placed. I think they're perfect. Okay, g5. Um, I think queen h5 makes a lot of sense. Because bishop e2... Bishop e2, rook e3, bishop h5, bishop d4. I go up a piece and the rook is protected. So that doesn't work. Um, you can't offer me... Can you offer me a queen trade? Say queen f3. I suppose you can, because I can't do this. Queen f3. If I accept the queen trade, maybe I just go b3, because the knight will no longer be defending the b3 square, and they start ripping things apart. That's an idea. Also, because g5 is played, um, like I said many moves ago, um, it makes it more difficult to play f5 now because it doesn't have the support of the g-pawn. I don't... Un I guess, okay, you're unpinning your bishop. All right. Can we go b3? Trying to play on the fact the knight can't take because of the pin? Maybe. Maybe. Although b3, c3 looks good for white. F6 I don't think is as viable anymore because I don't want to have to take with my g-pawn and open up my king. Rook c8 looks decent just to get on the c-file. Maybe mm, Rook c3, I don't think it does anything to be honest. Don't think it does anything. I'm trying to calculate some weird lines here, but I don't think they work. My queen is still a bit trapped. She can't do a whole lot. You know, I'd love to have her on a square like b6 right now, adding to this pin, but or getting involved in the attack on this diagonal. But yeah, she's just been caught a bit offside, which is good work from my opponent. 
This bishop, I'm not sure where I want to put it. So I think rook c8 is just a good move. We defend the bishop, which, I mean, we could have had tactics go against us somehow with the fact the bishop is undefended. So we get rid of any possibility of that. C2 is potentially weak. So we just get the rook looking at that. But it's just, it's just an improving move. It's just an improving move, really. Um, I'm not sure what I want to do in this position, like I said. Maybe b3 is the idea, because it looks very tempting. But I'm not sure if it actually works out after c3. If we go like b2, rook b1, rook a2. I don't know what we achieve there. Oh, was that the idea? Is he, is he just going to go for a repetition? I think he might. I think he might, and I don't think we can stop him. Unless after bishop d3, we sack the rook. Wow, okay. Um, if he tries h5, we have the e4 square. So that's not going to trap the queen. I think he's just going to go back to d3, which is a very nice idea. Because I think white has the worst position, objectively. And I'm very tempted to sack the rook if he does do that. Very tempted. Because we'll have a bishop pair versus no bishops. Bishop d3, rook takes pawn takes, we've got a passed b-pawn, this pin is still strong, and he can't support it from the d-file anymore because there's a pawn in the way. Um, which is obviously good. We still have the problem of getting the queen into the game, but bishop d3, rook takes pawn takes, bishop b5, I'm going to do it, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do it. I think it'd be boring not to, for a start. But I think we have a lot of compensation for the exchange. The move bishop b5 looks difficult for white to combat. Rook a8 also exists to try and play rook a2, but he can meet it with rook a1 for now. So I don't want to do that just yet. Bishop b5, we threaten um, queen d3. Say queen e3 to defend, that's the only... I suppose he could do something like king e2, opening up the rook. The point is that the um, knight is still pinned. b3 exists, but again I'm not sure it does anything. I don't know if I'm getting myself into more trouble by sacking the exchange than it's worth, but... We'll see, we've done it now, so I've got to try and make the most of it. Got to try. I'd love to play this, but yeah, very unfortunate. Mm. Okay, what about bishop a4, rook a1, bishop d4, queen d4, rook c2. King e1, we don't have a follow-up, because my queen is just stuck. Completely stuck. That's so frustrating. What about, what about queen h5? Because if queen h5, and for whatever reason I can now play, so queen h5, if I get bishop a4 in, rook a1, Bishop takes, queen takes, and then here. Then we're threatening to get in on e2. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. I'm expecting rook c1, I think. I think that's the move I'm expecting. Just to make it difficult for me to move, which is an annoying move to face, to be honest. Uh, I don't really want to. If rook c1, maybe I can go b3 to try and deflect the rook. That's an idea. Fortunately, there's no back rank tricks with moving the knight and trying to sack the queen because my bishop defends the rook. I suppose I always have bishop to f8 ideas if I need it. But that's worth watching out for. 
Uh, just ideas like, I don't know, Rook to C1 followed by uh, like Knight to E6. Yeah, okay, so he does play it. I think that's the logical move. Hmm. Yeah, let's go B3. We have to create a distraction. Currently, the Queen and the Knight are tied down. This Rook doesn't have an obvious plan. Um, and this Rook is really annoying, so I want it to move. I also am creating the idea of Bishop to B4. And that would be really bad for White. Because the King would be forced to E3. Can it survive on E3? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But that idea exists. We may not actually use it. It may be just more of a potential threat. And wow, my opponent sacks the rook back for the bishop. So we're, we're back to being up a pawn. And he can now take on b3 with the knight, relieving some of the pressure. Not all of it, though, because his king is still in the open. And if knight b3, rook b5, we're threatening the knight. We're also threatening rook b2 to pick up the queen. Again, my queen is still struggling to get back into the game. But the more pieces that get traded off, the more holes are going to open up in the position, potentially, for my queen to make her way back into the game. Yeah, no, I, I saw that move, but it doesn't work because of rook c2 check. So that's why I was saying that um, white had to take the pawn on b3 if he wanted to win the material back. Because this is a nice idea. If I take the knight back, I lose the rook. But I have this intermezzo check, and it's actually far worse than that because you're going to lose a queen. My opponent resigns. Well played. That was a very, very balanced game. I think that black had the advantage for most of the game. But my opponent fought back really, really well, to be fair to him. Um, sacking the rook back, I'm not sure about. Uh, that seemed a bit unnecessary. I guess this idea just spooked him. Which is one of the reasons I played the move pawn to b3 anyway, because bishop to b4 just looks scary. Having to play king e3 is like, mm, you know, not, not good, potentially. Uh, just aesthetically, it looks horrible. Um, but yeah, he did his best to fight back. And then in uh, this ending sort of position with knight to e6, I think he might have had to try knight b3 and after rook b5, maybe rook b1. Because if you move the knight, then, you know, you get skewered. This is what I was expecting him to do. And then I probably, well, I might play queen g4 to try and work my way into the position a bit. Not obvious how I would have gone about this position. Maybe g6 to give my king an escape square. But very interesting game. Very well played to my opponent. He tried a tactic at the end that didn't work, and thank you all very much for watching. We're going to do a quick analysis before the video ends, just like 10 minutes. So I'd encourage you to stick around for that if you want to kind of delve a bit deeper into the ideas of the position. If you enjoyed the video, please let me know in the comments what you liked and what I could improve on for future videos, whether it's from an educational standpoint or just purely from an entertainment. If you... um are watching this video you made it this far and you're not subscribed and you haven't liked the video bruv what are you doing you just spent about half an hour here with me so please drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already let's get into a quick analysis okay the um the game review is not very um not very nice in this one 67 percent for my opponent 73.3 for myself my opponent did find a brilliant move he did find a brilliant move so you will be seeing what that is. You may already have figured it out. But okay, the opening takes takes, d4, and it's just equal because of the knight on c3, right? It's just an equal position because white should be better, but because of the knight on c3, he isn't. Like I said, it's misplaced. We develop bishop g5. I was a bit confused as to what to do. e6 is inaccurate. Knight c6 is better. But here, I just didn't like taking with the e-pawn. Because the d-pawn's isolated, but I suppose my bishop's going to be strong. I'm going to castle quickly. Maybe it is better than I thought, but 
Either way, he takes for no reason. We take back. Knight f3, a6. Just continue to develop. Uh, Queen e3 was odd. Knight c6 is an inaccuracy. Okay. Castle. Castle. a3, which is a mistake. We go back to d6, which is better than a5. Which I thought a knight a4 was the problem here. It's not a massive problem. G4 is the issue. Just, okay, okay, okay. I guess the difference is if we go bishop d6, then g4 isn't playable because of this. I was expecting king b1, which is the best move. And if bishop to f4, queen d3, b5. Again, b4 tries to play on the hook on a3. g3 is played, which is still a decent move. Bishop d7, bishop d3, b5, b4. And a5 is inaccurate. We should have prepared a little bit first with rook fc8. I suppose this pawn break was never going anywhere. So I could have just played a bit slower, but we go a5. Knight b5. Bishop e7, and that's the mistake. So I needed to retreat the bishop, but I needed to keep an eye on e5 to stop knight e5. The problem with bishop to e7 is it allowed knight e5. Makes sense. Makes sense. So knight e5 is played by my opponent. It's the o one of the only really good moves in the position. I wasn't sure what to do. Knight, knight e5 is not the best. Rook fd8 is better. Just defending the bishop. I suppose that makes a lot of sense. So I don't allow this pawn to take and attack my queen. Um, the best move for white is c3. A b4, a b4, knight, knight b4, c b4, bishop b5, no, bishop b5, bishop b5, and rook a2, and black is down a whole piece, but the position is equal. <laughs> How? Can... No, that can't be played. Okay. Knight b7, rook c8, king b1, queen g6. If you take, then you get mated. This is a mental position. But I played knight e5, and yeah, so I was hoping for queen e5, and then exchanging a b4, a b4, and then bishop to b4. And I thought I probably had an advantageous endgame here, and the computer agrees with me. But my opponent instead took with the pawn, which was the right move. Queen g5. The computer does think that white should exchange here. f4, bishop e7, and knight d6, which was the line I suggested my opponent could play. And then now I can't recapture the pawn on b4, so I'm down a pawn. My opponent's pawns are weak, but he is up a pawn at the end of the day. Rook fb8, c3, and then like rook a2. Again, this can't really be played, but I guess it can, and then bishop to b1. Takes, takes, rook, rook a6. Oh, okay. And then it's probably just slightly better for white because of the past b pawn. But he goes f4 without trading the queens, which I thought gave me more of a chance. Knight d4 is just a blunder, though. I didn't really understand that, because then we just... Well, after this g4 idea, queen h4 was apparently better. I rejected it because of knight to f3. Then, ah... Okay, I missed that. I missed that. Queen h6, h4, and here f5 is the best. Whoa. If gf5, ba3, okay, and if en passant, then queen f6, and we get back into the game like this, and d6 is defended. Okay, rook a3 is a mistake, but it's still good. King d2, bishop c5, again the computer wants f5, or g6, or king. Yeah, it wants f5 or g6. It does like the idea of b3, actually. But um, we chose bishop c5, g5, queen h5, queen f2. Here I went rook c8, bishop e2, queen g6, bishop d3. What? up? Oh, the computer wants queen d3. 
CD3 and Rook A2. And you can't block with the Knight because your Queen hangs. And if you move your King, the Queen hangs and then the Knight hangs. And it's completely winning for black. Wow. If only I'd seen that idea. I didn't know. I saw Rook takes. And black is slightly better. But Queen H5 is not a good move. Rook C1. Queen F3 was better, which is kind of what I expected him to play. And go into this, where white is... White is up in exchange. But I guess black has to pass B pawn, which makes things interesting. Something like this. And then, yeah, like here, white is losing. So it's very easy for him to go wrong. Because I have the bishop pair, the passed pawn, and the open rook. But okay. We went b3 here. And I was trying to deflect his rook to a square like b1. Because... Well, here, yeah, you completely lose. That was kind of my point. To try and deflect the queen and the knight away. Uh, the There was queen f3 again, just going for a queen trade. If bishop b4, king e3, rook c2. If takes, takes. White's got to be really careful here. Rook c1, bishop a4. This looks tough to deal with. You might have to, if I do something like this, just give the rook back. And then try and win back the c-pawn with the knight to get an equal endgame. But my opponent plays rook c5, which is actually a brilliant move. After rook c5, knight e6 blunders the game. As we, um, as we know. As we know. So the, best, the better move was queen e2. Again, trying to offer a queen trade. Queen e2, king e2. We are just up a pawn. I guess it's tough to defend it though, because um, bishop a4, rook a1, white is better because of my back rank weaknesses. So I think I just have to give the pawn back. h6. If knight b3, rook b5, knight b4, give a check or something. White's slightly better. But it's an interesting end game nonetheless. But yeah, my opponent just blunders a tactic. Rook c2 wins the game. A bit of a messy game from both sides, to be honest. But I think a lot of interesting tactical and strategic ideas explored nonetheless. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to check out the previous episodes of this series, the playlist will be linked below. And if you want to have a look at the other playlist linked below, that features every single video on my channel, which features the Karo Khan defense. So I'd encourage you to watch either of those playlists. I'll see you in the next one.